All right, friends, this is the fourth Sunday of Advent. It's the, the day that we proclaim the love of God as made known in Jesus Christ. What else can we possibly say about love that hasn't already been said, right? I don't know, may, maybe nothing. But then again, if there were ever one truth that bears repeating again and again and again, is it not the truth of the love of God made known in Jesus Christ, church? Get an amen on that. Yes. Well, what is, what is that? What is, what is love at the deepest level? What is Christian love all about? There is a group of people every couple of years that surveys a group of elementary-aged children on that question. And uh, I came upon the most recent batch of answers from kids, and I thought I would share some of these with you today. These are answers to the question, what is love all about? All right. Glenn, age seven, said this. If falling in love is anything like learning how to spell, I don't want to do it. <laughs> it takes too long. Manuel, age eight. I think you're supposed to get shot with an arrow or something, <laughs> but the rest of it isn't supposed to be so painful. <laughs> maybe, maybe. Okay, this is May now, age nine. She says, I, I'm not sure why love happens, but I heard, I heard it has something to do with how you smell. <laughs> That's why perfume and deodorant are so popular, <laughs> she says. <clears throat> Ava, age eight, says, one of you should know how to write a check. <laughs> because, because, she says, even if you have tons of love, there's still going to be a lot of bills. <laughs> Amen? Amen? Amen. All right. Now, Angie, come on. An this is tough now. Angie's a, she's 10 years old, and she says this. Most men are brainless, she said. <laughs> so you might have to try more than once to find a live one. All right. All right, Angie. Now, Kirsten is 10 years old, and she said, look, being single is better. She said, being single is better, y'all, for the simple reason that I wouldn't want to change no diapers. She said, of course, if I did get married, I would figure something out. She said, I would just phone my mother and have her come over for some coffee and diaper changing. <laughs> okay. Now, this is... They, Dave is, is eight years old. Everybody knows a Dave. Dave says, love will find you even if you are trying to hide from it. Dave said, I've been trying to hide from it since I was five, but the girls keep finding me. <laughs> All right, Dave. Now, Mike, Mike was 10 years old, and he said, I thought this was pretty precocious of Mike. On the first date... They just tell each other lies. And that usually gets them interested enough to go for a second date. <laughs> all right, and this, this, is, this one's my favorite one of all here, and this is John, who's nine years old. John says, love is like an avalanche where you have to run for your life. <laughs> Amen. Ooh, now, on a more serious note, I, I asked a group of youth a question like this years ago. Uh, church I served before I came here, and, uh, and I asked them, what is, what is true love? How do you know when it's really love, right? And, and this young man answered in a way that I think was, was fair. I, I understand where he's coming from. I think it was an honest answer, but it made me wince just a little bit, okay? He said, love is when, when all the troubles melt away and you just feel perfect. Everything just feels perfect all the time. Ooh, I don't know, I don't know, is that, is that right? I, I think that's, uh, that's certainly the message that we see in popular culture, right? We watch these movies, and we get to the end, and everything just resolves into perfect blessedness, right? Perfect bliss, everything feels just right. They don't show us, you don't have to watch the couple, you know, fighting over bills, right, and and changing diapers and, and doing dishes and all that stuff. We just get six words. And they lived happily ever after. No, they didn't. 
No, they didn't. Faithfully, I hope, lovingly, yeah, maybe even joyfully, right? Happily? Uh, I don't know. I don't know, friends. And it makes me wonder. It makes me wonder. Now, certainly, I'm not saying that all relationships are meant to be. Certainly, there are, there are relationships that are unhealthy that people need to get out of, okay? But having said that, I, I do wonder how many relationships that might really have potential fall short of that potential because people think that, that this is what love is, right? That, that feeling of perfect blessedness when all the problems go away. And as soon as they find themselves at a place in life where that feeling just kind of begins to wane just a little bit, maybe they wonder, oh, was that really love then? Maybe this wasn't true love. All right, what does Scripture say? What does Scripture say about love? Now, we're all familiar with 1 Corinthians 13, right? That's the standard love passage used at just about every wedding ever in history, right? But some scholars that I, that I follow and admire argue that actually 1 Corinthians 13 is not the most powerful and poignant statement in the New Testament of what love is, but rather 1 John chapter 4. So let's look at this together. 1 John chapter 4 beginning in verse 7. You can see this on the screen, those of you at home. You can also take your Bibles out. We're going to be coming, to, uh, coming back to a few of these sections of this passage throughout the message today. So if you'd like to take your Bible out in your pew, feel free to do that as well and follow along. All right, 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 12. Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent His only Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. And together we say, thanks be to God. Amen. All right. Well, there's a lot here. This is a powerful passage. We could probably spend an hour on every single verse in that passage. Let's not. Okay. But there are three major things that, that I want to draw out here for you as we, as we think, as we pray about what it really means to love in the image of Christ, what it means to love in the Christian sense. Okay, first of all, that famous line there, verse 8, a triad of words, God is love, not love is God, not love is God right? We have to be careful with that, right? Verse 7, I think, drives this home. It says, love is from God, not love is God. We have to be careful because we might get, we might get this idea in our minds that we know what love is and then base our understanding of God on that, right? I know what love is. I've seen Sleepless in Seattle, Love is that, that feeling of perfect blessedness, right? When all the problems melt away, right? And, and, and so that must, be, that must be who God is too, my divine genie, right? Meeting me uh, at my point of need with whatever I want, you know, give, giving me, giving me that, that, uh, that easy, perfect life full of everything I've ever wanted. Hmm, okay, not, not love is God. God is Love. Everything that God is, love is. Right? We define love based on what God is and how God has revealed God's self in and through Jesus Christ. Okay? God is love, which leads us to the second important point in this text. What is that? What does God's love look like? Look at verse 9 again. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. How did God show God's love? 
The answer is this, friends. This is important. If you hear only this today, hear, hear this. If you hear nothing else, hear this. God put God's self in it together with us. How did God reveal God's love? God put God's self in it with us. God got down in the mess and the muck and the challenge of life. God could have remained in the comfort of not physical existence, right? But that is not what God chose. God chose to get down in it with us. God chose to pour God's self out into this world that we might come to, to know God, that we might understand through Jesus Christ, God incarnate, how to live, right? That, that, uh, that God might lift our burdens, that, that, that God might carry us through the challenges of this life. God got down in it with us. And friends, this is what we celebrate when we celebrate the manger. This is what we celebrate when we celebrate Christmas. This is what incarnation is all about. God got down in it with us that we might know fullness of life. The scholar Jürgen Moltmann says this. This is powerful. Let these words flow over you, okay? God heals sicknesses and griefs by making suffering and grief God's suffering and grief. In the image of the crucified God, the sick and the dying can see themselves. Why? Because in them, the crucified God has recognized God's self. God got down in it with us in the person of Jesus Christ. And in doing that, God shows us what true love really is. It's not just a matter of not just a matter of reaching down from lofty heights, right, and sprinkling out a little bit of blessing or, or even giving somebody a hand, right? That's not what it's about. It's about getting down in it together. It's a matter of getting down in the messiness of life with people, doing the best that we can to be authentic with them, to perceive the, 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 the divine spark within them, to recognize each one as a child of God. Right? It's about getting down and, and, uh, and, and helping to, to bear one another's burdens, friends. Meeting each other in our shortcomings, our imperfections, all of our humanity, and calling out the dignity and the goodness of every single created child of God. That's what true love is all about. And third and finally, friends, when we look at this passage together, that's what this passage tells us, that our purpose our purpose is to learn to love like that. That's what God first did for us in Jesus Christ. And our purpose is to get down in it with hurting, hungry, broken people and learn to love like that. That attentive, that self-sacrificing love. When we do that, God dwells in us. It says it right here, verse 12. God dwells in us and God's love is perfected in us. We don't figure out how to do this on our own, right? That's what this is about, okay? We have to learn how to do this from the one who did it first, the one who got down in it with us. And the more willing we are to be in it with hurting people, when it might just be easier to get out, the more of an impact that we can have, the more of an impact that God can have through us. What do you think the parable of the Good Samaritan is all about? right? Getting down in the ditch with a hurting person. Helping to bear their burden and lifting them up in love. When I think about that, there's a there's an image that forms in my mind of a person that I know and love deeply. He's lived like this his entire life. He spent the better part of his life and his career as a medical doctor doing the best that he could to journey with people, to get down in it with people in some of the most challenging seasons of their lives, right? And then when his wife got sick, when his wife got sick, he left everything else behind and, and drew on everything that he'd learned as a doctor, as a husband, as a Christian, 
to journey with her in that last year of her life. To do everything he could to, to shower out whatever blessing and, and goodness he could upon her. And then when she passed, when she passed, he had a choice. And I imagine it wasn't an easy choice. Uh, he could have just sort of drifted into the afterglow of a life well lived. And I, I could have understood that choice if that's what he had chosen, right? I imagine, he and I haven't talked about this, I imagine that he, he intentionally wrestled with the choice, do I live or do I die? And, and people in this room who have lost their beloved, uh, people who have lost a child perhaps, anybody who's lost someone really close to them, I know has wrestled with that question. Do I live or do I die? And, and maybe on some level, uh, it's, it's appealing to choose to die. I mean, the, the idea of just, uh, just going on into the arms of God to be with your beloved. I could understand why somebody would make that choice. But this person chose to live. Knowing that life, friends, is a precious gift. We've just got the one. We've just got the one. Knowing that every breath is a precious gift from God. Knowing that every moment of this life is an opportunity to pour out love in the image of Christ. He chose to live. Started a respite care ministry here at First Christian Church. Started a Parkinson's support group. Got involved with a diabetes support group. Served as an elder at this church. Celebrated as, as great-grandchildren, both biological and spiritual, entered into this world. And today, friends, we had the opportunity to, to stand with him over here in our gathering area and celebrate 90 years with Dr. Rogers Coleman. Happy birthday, Doc. Amen. <laughs> Friends, every one of us has a choice, okay? We too have a choice. Doesn't matter if you're 90 or 9, okay? Do I, do I live? Do I die? Do I, do I look at other people, especially those that I might disagree with or not like, as other? Do I see them as, as other? Do I see them as problems to be solved or enemies to be subdued? Or do I recognize that there is, that there is in each one of us and in each one of them a divine spark that binds us together in a way that transcends any differences? that we might bear, right? Do we choose, friends, to recognize that we are all in this messy thing called life together and that God, that God calls us to live and to love accordingly? Well, I held back a couple of these quotes, all right? <laughs> so let me leave you with just a couple more as we close today. How about this? This came from... Bonnie, age seven. She says, love is what's in the room with you at Christmas if you stop opening presents and listen. Were you that wise at seven, Bonnie? Was this you? Was that you? Billy was four when he said this. He said, when someone loves you, the way they say your name is different. You just know that your name is safe in their mouth. Okay, one more. This is from author and lecturer Leo Buscalia. He once talked about a, a contest that he was invited to judge. The purpose of the contest was to find the most loving child. Well, the winner was a four-year-old child whose next-door neighbor was an elderly gentleman who had recently lost his wife. Upon seeing the man cry, the little boy walked across the street into the old gentleman's yard, walked up onto his porch where the man was sitting, 
climbed up into his lap and just sat there. When his mother asked what he had said to the neighbor, the little boy said, nothing. I just helped him cry. God bless you and Merry Christmas, church.